We welcome friends to this monthly meeting, the South Sang meeting, which we're having every month. The purpose of this meeting is that we remain on track on our spiritual path. Our minds being what they are, we get so distracted by our daily life, our daily obligations, that we forget the main purpose for which we have a human body. The human body is the only form of life out of specified 8.4 million forms of life on this planet. The human body is the only form of life in which we use what is called free will, the capacity to make a choice, the capacity to make decisions, the capacity to use your mind to think and decide whether to go right or left, whether to do this or not. All these decision makings are possible only in human life. Not all the time, only sometime. We think we can decide things all the time, but if you look at your life, 80% of your life, you had no decision making power. You had no decision making power where you are born. You have no decision making power where you die. No decision-making power where you'd have accidents. No decision-making power where you'd meet strangers. No decision-making where you'd fall in love with somebody. No decision-making. These are things that happen automatically, as if there's a pre-programmed destiny we are bringing with us when we are born. But the 20% time, which are not these fixed events, we are given options, alternatives, to decide. And that is where we use free will. People ask me, is it really free? If you believe in God, then it is not. If you don't believe in God, then it is. Because if you believe in God, the definition of God in all religions, no matter by what name they have called that creative power or God, says God is omnipresent, present everywhere, omnipotent, all the power is, is of the God, and omniscient, knows everything. If God does not know what decision you are going to make, then he is no God. And if he knows what decision you are going to make, then decision is already made. And you have to go with God's will, God's decision making power. Therefore, if you believe in God, you cannot have free will. The free will is dictated by the will of God. If you're an atheist, then you can say, God doesn't exist. I make my own decisions. Is there a definite way by which you can check this out? What is true? Do we have real free will, which we feel we have right now? in the human body, or we don't. It can be validated, checked by a simple process. The process is going to be going within your own self where the decisions are made. Whenever we use free will, we use our mind. We think. It's a thinking process. That is how we make decisions. It's a deliberative process. We deliberate, not merely think. You deliberate the pros and cons. Is, which is better for me? Which do I like more at this time? And you make that decision. People study this human body and the brain, and they're very impressed by it. A very complex anatomy of this body. How Millions and millions of miles of nerves are placed in a very small body. The nervous system is so huge in this, if you stretch them out. The DNA molecule, which is in the center of every cell of this body, is a double coiled, small little piece, compressed to fit in one cell of, of every, every cell, including a skin cell, has a complete DNA molecule. But the DNA molecule, if you take it out and pull it to 
see its length wise. Not the coiled one, not the press compressed one, but pull it out to see its length. Can stretch almost up to one inch. And that DNA molecule in every cell of ours compacted. Can you imagine? The DNA molecule can predict things like whether you'll be a smoker at age 40 or not. That's what they found out today. That, uh, is it containing all our destiny? Maybe it is. If the DNA molecule already given to us in our body at birth can contain our whole destiny, how can we have free will? We're just acting as slaves of a DNA molecule. We're just following it. It's very interesting to study the anatomy of the body. Have we studied the anatomy of consciousness? There's a book available <laughs> called The Anatomy of Consciousness. The author is supposed to be one Ishwar Chandrapuri, but I didn't write it. My wife wrote it. Of course, she based most of the book on the talks I had given, and they were transcribed, and from the transcription, she put them in the form of a book. But she added some of her own notes also to make it original. Some training she got from a Buddhist teacher she added that to the book and some embellished it a little bit, which I'm glad because when I started writing that book many years ago, I could only write one line, the title, Anatomy of Consciousness. And then I said, we are conscious because we are conscious. It's so difficult to understand consciousness because our whole idea of being conscious is being aware. I am conscious of this, that means I am aware of it. It presupposes that consciousness is merely a means of experiencing something that already exists. But supposing consciousness does more, that means supposing consciousness creates that which we experience at the same time as we experience. It's a very different definition of consciousness. This debate is not new. Does consciousness only experience what has been created or does consciousness create the experience that the subject which consciousness picks up should be pre-existing are called materialists. And a lot of material, materialist scientists, most scientists are materialists. They believe the empirical knowledge comes from studying matter outside, studying what is already there in our sensory experiences. Those who think that maybe all our experiences are merely being generated by consciousness using simple tools like a human mind and sense perceptions working in the mind. If sense perceptions are the only source of our knowledge of what is existing, Obviously, there is some validity to that argument. Sense perceptions are the power to see, hear, touch, taste, smell. These powers we are using every day to know the whole world. I want to know, is this cup real? Or is it just my consciousness creating it? I'll say, I can touch it cold water, taste it, absolutely real. My experience is absolutely real. How can I say that glass is not real? And yet, if I go to sleep and have a dream and I see the same glass in the dream and I touch it and I drink it, the experience will be real. If I wake up, the experience is still real. I still remember that there will be no glass. How did the glass come in the dream and I tasted the water, but there was no glass? No, oh, the dream projected it outside. Why didn't I know that? Because in the dream state, all I knew was that the dream was real. Everything looked real. Even if I found out it's a dream, 
And sometimes we have dreams where we find out we are dreaming. Supposing I find out it's a dream, I tell my friends, look, I know we are dreaming. When we wake up, there are no friends to tell. Even the statement of the truth does not give you the truth. You're telling the truth. It's a dream. You're not aware of it. We are saying the same thing. Maybe this wakeful state is also a dream. When can we definitely find out that what we saw in a dream was only a dream and not real, created by the mind, when we wake up? Can we find out while we are dreaming? No way. If we find out we are not dreaming, it's called daydreaming. Because then they are also awake to know that. This similarly, if there is a state of wakefulness, higher than this state of wakefulness, which we have risen from a sleep that we have and dream that we have, the higher state of wakefulness alone will tell us if this was also a dream. And all made up by the mind and consciousness. But there is a better way to validate this particular theory, you might say, or this particular explanation of creation, that the creation is just an experience taking place in our mind by projecting everything like we do in a dream. The best part is, if you really want to validate it, go within to the mind and study your mind. Not study outside things, because we are examining whether outside things exist or not, whether the mind can produce them. Go within yourself to the mind. Can it be done practically? Yes, certainly. What is preventing us from studying our own mind, which is working in the head? We know that, it's working in the head. Because when we think, we know we are thinking in the head, not in our hands, not in our legs or, uh, or limbs, not even in our heart. All thoughts are going on in our head. We can feel them behind the eyes. Therefore, what is preventing us from studying our mind is we are constantly using the main instrument of learning, which is paying attention outside. Our attention is captured by outside experiences all the time. We don't go within ourselves at all. It is just a brain, maybe gray matter, we don't know what is there. It's the physical anatomy of the body. But where are thoughts coming from? A person in front of us dies, he's dead. We bury him, cremate him, that there is nothing left. Why the brain is still there, everything is still there. There's no change in the physical structure of the physical body. Then what has gone away? Where's life gone? If a person doesn't have life, how can he think? So life and thinking appears to be very synonymous in a way. That thinking in the mind is creating our experience of life. The barrier to examining the mind is our attention is continuously on the created universe outside and we are wondering whether how it was created. But not going back to study, can the mind create it? Can it be a dreamlike experience? To do that, to examine the mind per se with nothing else, you have to do only two things. One, don't have the physical body. Secondly, don't have sense perceptions. Remove them, you'll know the mind. And do you have to die to get this? to remove the body, to remove sense perceptions, does the body have to die? Not at all. You can pretend you are dead. How about that? But pretend very strongly, in a very systematic way. Systematic ways to see if our attention, operating through sense perceptions, is getting all the knowledge of a created universe. Let's withdraw our attention from the created universe and put it on what we realize is our self, not the body, not the senses, not the mind, life. If we want to examine what our life is, what makes us conscious at all, what makes us alive at all, 
then we should be able to perform a little trick on ourselves by putting all our attention inside the head, not outside. Where exactly do we put our attention? Where we think we are as thinking beings. Those who are thinking, we have to put attention there. Not anywhere. We have two eyes. Supposing we had one eye, all of us, we would not have had space in front of us. The concept of space has come because of two eyes. If supposing we had one ear, they would have no idea of direction at all. Did you know that? Why we have two eyes and why we have two ears? To create space and direction. And we have something else inside which creates the flow of time. That's our mind. If we are putting our attention within ourselves, what happens? Not only we put attention on what is happening inside, inside, behind the eyes. But at that point in the eyes, we are in spite of two eyes, we are seeing a single image outside. You know, you go to a movie, 3D movie, they give you glasses to wear. They used to give green and red glasses. And the movie was shot in two colors. They were two different pictures, taken with the cameras at the same distance as the two eyes. These two eyes are not seeing the same thing. The two eyes are seeing two different pictures. We are seeing one. Where is the combination taking place? If you carefully examine, I, I give simple examples to people, that when you are looking at a distance, and you place your finger in front of you, you see two fingers. One is generally more prominent than the other, which, which is your prominent eye. If you look at the finger and join it together, you have done something to the eyes to come here, the rest of it gets blurred into two pictures. That means the eyes are seeing two pictures. There's a combination that we are doing. Where are we actually seeing one image? We are seeing behind the eyes in the center of the brain, exactly in the center. Anatomy, if you say the anatomy of the head, it's exactly the point which is the, where the pituitary body hands and the medulla oblongata, where the pineal gland is just on the side touching the pituitary gland. No wonder they say the pineal gland runs all our hormones in the body. All thought processes are coming from there. I had an experience with a brain surgeon who had done more than 1,000 brain surgeries, and he came to India to treat a patient, a VIP who had come from another country, who had an accident, car accident, and was in coma. So we asked him, he's unconscious. What makes one conscious? And that eminent doctor said, the surgeon, he said, I have done thousands of surgeries of the brain. We have no answer where consciousness comes from. But we do know that if we put a laser beam on the pineal gland, right at the center of the head, the man becomes unconscious. Therefore, we know the seat of consciousness in the human body, but we don't know how it comes and where it goes when a person dies. At least it is known. Now, if you examine only by contemplation, if I am seeing two things, where am I combining? Same spot. If you want to know where am I thinking from? Same spot. How easy it is to know that right in the center is where you think from. Not only think, right in the center where you imagine from. You can close your eyes, imagine anything. Imagine you are sitting on a chair. Where are you sitting? Well, not a picture. If you make a picture of yourself inside, you are sitting in front. Where are you watching the picture from? The center of the head. It's a very well located place. Supposing people do meditation. In meditation they say, let's go to third eye center. Where is the third eye? And why is it called third eye? 
is called third eye because these two eyes don't see. The third eye sees when it combines the two pictures. That's why third eye is very important. We are seeing from there a big visual experience of the main sense perception is taking place at third eye. We don't have to find it. We are there. If you close your eyes and say, if I am just a point of consciousness, where am I? Automatically you'll be at third eye. You are there in the wakeful state. Not every state. Only in human wakeful state when we are seeing this world and close our eyes, we are in the third eye set. We are not seeing ourselves there, we are, we are there. So that is why people make a big mistake. In meditation, at third eye center, they start locating. Where is the third eye? And they start saying, am I sitting there? Can I watch myself? No, you are not watching. You should watch what is the space in front of you. You should watch what is around you. To make it very simple, I can tell you how to look at the third eye center. Your two eyes draw straight lines behind the eyes. Two straight lines going back to the head. Draw a straight line between your ears. These two straight lines will cross that one straight line. That middle part is like a bench you are sitting there. That's the third eye center. Good meditation is when you believe, imagine, you are there. And put your attention there. What will happen? If you put your attention there and concentrate and think only what is happening there, nowhere else. And not think what happened before, not remembering other things that happened outside, no. Only think of what is happening there. Can I see what I can see there? Can I get up there? Can I dance there? Can I sing there? Can I do all the activities there in imagination? If you do that, your attention is being pulled there. After some time you'll see, you do not know where your physical hands are. You won't know where your physical feet are. You won't know later, if you continue, where your arms and legs have gone. You'll, you'll wonder, you'll say, where have they gone? And then you open your eyes, you, the physical body is there. You're only losing awareness of the physical body by putting attention and concentrating it inside. This is not something unusual. We are doing it all the time. You go to an orchestra. So many instruments are playing. You say, I like the drums. And concentrate your attention on the drums. The drums become louder and other instruments become weak. Nothing has changed there. Your attention has the capacity to concentrate on one and become unaware of the rest. And that's the big power. And that power is used if you concentrate at the center, you become unaware of this body. With some practice, you can be completely unaware of the body and be fully aware of yourself with the sense perceptions intact. When we imagine ourselves, supposing you were to all imagine you had come up and stood near me next on this stage. Not difficult. It's just an imagination. And your imaginary self is here. But your labor, your body is there. How can you imagine you are here? It's just an act of imagination because imagination is merely using your attention at a particular point. You're putting your attention here. Part of your attention has come here, most of it is sitting there. What would happen if you placed more than 50% of your attention in coming and standing next to me? Do you know what will happen? If you try, put your attention standing next to me, this will become real, that will become unreal. That is the reality of a physical being. It's all sense perceptions through attention. When we do this, exercise of placing our attention inside in the third eye center where we are in the wakeful state, we can become unaware of the physical body and realize that sense perceptions are not only still there, they are more enhanced than you ever saw before. This power of imagination is not as imaginary as we think. It's imaginary so long as our attention, bulk of attention is in the physical body. Our attention is spread all over the physical body and through the physical body in the physical universe. 
then the only thing that's keeping us away from using imagination to turn it into something more real than this. Supposing you have weak eyes, like I have weak eyes, we have to use glasses to read at my age, you know. When I read a newspaper in my imagination, 2020 vision. I can hear things very clearly, no hearing aid is needed. Even at my age, the inside sense perceptions are always very sharp. The, the fact that they are weak is because they are covered with physical body. Sense perceptions are not part of physical body. We think they are. Why? Because we take the physical body to be the only reality. And the other is all imagination, just a function of the mind. But try this experiment, how sense perceptions can be separated by becoming unaware of the body through this kind of meditation. Anybody can do it and validate that there is something in, in us which functions independently of the physical body. But we are using it through the physical body and never separate it. That can be done. What is the advantage of doing it? The advantage is a knowledge of the structure of our consciousness. We are now examining the anatomy of our consciousness. That consciousness is operating not directly from this brain, but is partly operating in sense perceptions, the five sense perceptions, independently of this body. We can imagine we are flying. Can we really fly? This body cannot fly, except an aeroplane. But the other body can. What's the difference between that imaginary body which can become real if we become unaware of this body? The difference is only one. This has matter, atoms, molecules in it. That doesn't. The rest is the same. This body provides sense perceptions because of the inner body. And that can be separated for experience, not by dying, by dying while living. That's why they say the secret of discovering the truth about yourself is die while living. That means just withdraw attention. This is like pretending to be dead. A famous Rishi, Maharishi Raman in India actually discovered this by pretending to die. He thought he was very ill, he was going to die. And then he said, what will happen when I die? Then he pretended he was dead and stopped breathing. I'll hold my rigor mortis are set in my body. I'll stretch my body like that. I am feeling so strong inside. My self perceptions are still there. How am I dead? The beginning of his spiritual career. Anybody can try that. So once you find out that sense perceptions can work independently and they function like a body. We sometimes call it the astral body, ethereal body, sensory system body no matter what name you give it, but it can be very easily achieved by simple practice of placing your attention behind the eyes, third eye center. But that does not answer my original question. Do we have free will? For that you have to go to one more step. Next step is to place your attention in the third eye center of the inner body. Inner body also has the same form. That's why it's used to fitting into this body. If you now meditate after becoming unaware of this body and meditate in the head behind the eyes of the inner body, you will become gradually unaware of the sense perceptions also. Then what happens? You discover your mind. First time you will know what your mind is, which you never knew till now. You thought it's just a thinking process going on because you are alive, you will see the mind is nothing but another body of yours. Just a cover upon life, it's a cover upon your own self, real self. Just using it. What is it doing? It has no sense perception because we have left it behind, no physical body, left it behind, in awareness only. It's still there, but it's just meditating. When we discover our mind, we discover everything about destiny. 
we discover all our destiny is made by us at our mind state, not anywhere else. It's a wonderful experience to see that what we thought was our karma, our life, good and bad, was merely picking up a simple causal DVD and just playing it. And that's our life. We played it at the astral sensory level and then we played it at this level to enhance its beauty, to enhance its reality. When you discover your mind, what, what is it doing? Basically, right now it's a thinking machine, but a good thinking machine. It thinks all the time, never stops. If it stops, it will die. A heartbeat, you say, is like the heartbeat of the body. If it stops, it will die. If the thinking stops, mind dies. Thinking never stops. But how, is it, how does it start thinking? What are, what are the essential nature of thought? When you examine that, you discover that the very first structure to place thoughts is the creation of time and space. No thought can take place if there is no time and space. All thoughts are in time and in space. Now scientists say time, time space is just one, one thing, there is just the different ordinates of that one space-time. There you discover the, how the space-time is being created and how thoughts are being placed on it just because you want to play on a chosen destiny of your choice. If we say, over here, do we have free will? We can't answer this question. Then you will say, we with some higher power were able to pick up a life in the form of something that we played out, like we're playing here. And it was picked up out of infinite number of opportunities that we had which one to pick up. Why did we pick up the kind of life we are leading? Many people tell me, didn't we, weren't we wise enough to pick up something better? We must be very stupid people there. And with all the ups and downs of life that we picked up. No, we were very intelligent when we picked up our life. The reason was, first of all, we knew it's a created reality. And that's where the answer will come. And the materialists are wrong. And the idealists who said that we are creating reality were right. Personal validation, not believing anybody, not going to religion to believe something. Personal validation, that is the mind that creates everything. And you can create anything you want from there, not here. Here we are playing out something. When you start playing a DVD, you can't change the middle. You have to change the DVD itself and put a new one. You can do that from that state. Imagine the flexibility that you get just by two steps of meditation. In the meditation workshop we have, I guide people. It's not very difficult. It's very simple. All I'm saying is withdraw your attention to the center of this head, to the center of the inner head. That's all. If you are interested, have the determination to use your attention inside, you get it. But it doesn't answer the first part of my question, which was, if God knows everything, how can then you choose, even at that level, your destiny? Did, did you consult God? Well, for that you have to go another step. These two steps are not enough to get an answer. All you have found is that you are a living force using a mind. Does the living force also require time and space or only mind require time and space? You'll find living force doesn't need time and space. So we give a different name to the living force. What do we call it? Soul. We say we have a soul and a mind. 
soul is a living force that makes us alive, makes us conscious. Mind is what creates space and time, creates destiny, creates experiences here, creates all sensory experiences here. Now, if you want to know whether we consulted God or not, to pick up our DVD, one more step. Not a different one. The astral sensory body was like the shape of this body by usage. We have been using that in this body. We did use different forms of bodies also. Angels, animals, insects, lot of things. But this practice is being done in a human body where we think we have free will, where we can seek to do these things. Therefore, it looks like a human body. Mind does not look like a human body. Mind has combined the sense perceptions into one perception that includes all sense perceptions. The mind has the capacity to perceive directly, not I'm touching this, hearing this, seeing this, everything together. You can alternate. You won't know the distinction between seeing and hearing. It looks like you can see sound and hear light. The perception by the mind is very huge. It creates capacity. Therefore, when you go meditate, it still gives you like you have formed because of space-time, you have a form. What kind of form? Just a form. Sometimes people draw a picture of the physical body, very clear, said arms, feet, legs. Then they draw a picture of the astral body, a little bigger, to overlap this one. Then they draw the picture of the causal body, of just a little oblong. Sometimes this is just a piece of light in the spawn. It's just a consciousness operating to create time space and creating this experience. Since it has no form like the human form, it thinks from its own center. Next step, place your attention, still working with the mind, place the mental attention in the center of the causal body. It doesn't work. Sorry, people have tried, it doesn't work. Because you can't cross something like a mind by using the mind. Attention is a function of mind. Therefore, by putting attention anywhere, you can't cross it. You're just using more mind. All these experiences that I am telling, including this physical experience, including astral sensory experience, including experience of the mind by itself, all mental exercises, all created by the mind. Now you want to find how the mind can pick up something, how life, soul does something. You can't use the mind for that. That is why there's a big limitation. It's a huge limitation. There's a barrier. The mind cannot escape itself. It can only find more about itself. And that's what's going on. To go beyond that, you have to use something that is non-mental. Let's go to that. Something non-mental should be going on, not there or higher, here. It should be visible here. Yeah, there are some things that are non-mental right here. Things that do not need space and time. Things that do not need time, need any thinking. I'll give you three examples. First one, intuition. Intuitive knowledge, intuitive feeling comes not from the mind. Very often people have intuitive feeling, what they call gut feeling. I have a gut feeling this is going to happen. Mind says no, it cannot. Gut feeling says it can. Mind's answer is in time. Gut feeling is without time. It just comes spontaneously. It's happening here. We all have intuitive knowledge coming to us from time to time, we ignore it. We give preference to the mind. It appears that the gut feeling is coming from a hidden source behind the mind. Mind is in front, so we listen to the mind. We think mind is superior. That we have put wisdom into the mind. It's not in the mind. Intuition is more wise. If you were to study exactly how mind thinks, 
where it picks up its thought from, what is the conscious and subconscious areas of the mind, where is memory stored, what role the DNA molecule carrying all memories of all past lives carries. Study deeply, you will find the memory that is available to the mind to think is very limited. It's mostly data in front of it. Memory is very poor. It can't remember what happened a thousand years ago or a million years ago when it's just an amoeba. DNA molecules coming all the way. So that is why the mind's capacity to make decisions is very limited. Today we make a decision, tomorrow we say, oh, I, I didn't know about that, I forgot about that. That was the wrong decision I took. Mostly we make wrong decisions because of in inadequate data. Where does intuition pick up information from? Intuition picks up the timeless information from everything, from the whole background. Even what we are not remembering, intuition picks up that data. It's a very big thing. Okay, another example, more important, love. When you love somebody, it doesn't take time. It's instant. Love is instant, not attachment. That takes time. Attachment is mind. Love is soul. It's beyond mind. Third example I can give you. Just a look at the flower. Beautiful. I didn't examine it to study. If I study why are they beautiful? Oh, this is a red flower. This is this color. This is a beautiful vase, vase, beautiful things. That's mind. But the impact of beauty, soul, non-space time. These three functions continuously being performed in us, in conscious state, are coming from a different source than the mind. These are the three that take us beyond the mind. Not mental effort. That is why they say the real truth to find who you are is effortless. Because all effort is mind. Well, we are all using the mind for everything, including understanding what is effortless. I remember a friend of mine writing to me, saying, I have discovered effort does not give you the real answer to yourself, what you self is. Effort will confine you to your mind. Because all effort is mental. You have to say, I am going to do this, I am going to do this, I am going to make an effort. The I is the face, the ego is the face of the mind. That's why you never get the discovery of your own self by any effort. He wrote to me, very nice letter, describing how effort does not solve the problem. The last line was very interesting in his letter. Last line is, now I am going to try very hard on the effortless method. <laughs> mind again. You can't get out of it. Why can't we get out of it? Because we do not know where love comes from. We have mixed up our knowing about love, mixed it up with attachments. Don't forget, what is attachment? Attachment is liking something so much that you say, I love this, I love you, I love that person. I is as strong as the one you are loving, too. When somebody, you fall in love with somebody, you think of I? Not really. That's the only time I have seen in life that the I is placed back when you fall in love. That lover takes place. If you fall in love with somebody, the beloved takes place of the I. Automatically. Therefore, true spiritual discovery of your soul is only through love, joy, beauty, intuition, secret. But where will you find this love? How will you find? Can you find it? Again, effort. Trying to find it is effort. You can't find it. Sorry. But you can do one thing with your mind. You can seek that's a very big word, seek. They say seek and you will find. Seeking is different from searching, by the way. Search with your mind, seek with your soul. 
It's an intuitive seeking. When you seek, everybody wants to be loved. Everybody wants to love. Why is that? Because we are alive with the soul. The mere fact we have a soul makes us desirous, seekers of love. Now I want to tell you what is the role of a human being we call a perfect living master. What is the definition of a perfect living master? We call a human being who has transcended his mind and has awareness of his soul at all times, not sometimes during meditation. A person who has transcended the mind has actual living in a state of being, of our awareness, where these things are in reality. Love, beauty, joy, bliss, whatever names you give it. And his awareness transcends the division that we have amongst ourselves, which is all done by the mind. Remember, mind divides. Mind's method of discovery is called analysis. It analyzes everything. How do you analyze? Spit the sight. Then you analyze. A little child wants to understand a toy, wants to break it to see how it works. And we also do the same thing. Our whole division, even division into the many, has been created by the mind. You will discover that. The soul, intuitive power, unites, synthesizes, not analyzes. Big difference. There are human beings. Are they real? No, there are projections also. If everything is projected by us, we project a human being. If we discover that everything is being created by our mind, all of us are being created by our own minds, and we see the whole world just created by our mind, and the mind is the creator, creative power of this universe, everything in it is created by the mind, we create a human being in our experience who is perfect, because perfection comes by not staying within the bounds of the mind. I'll explain why that is so. The mind has certain functions through which it thinks. The thinking process creates doubt, skepticism. It's necessary. It is designed to alert us, alarm us. Don't be carried away by anything people say. That's called doubt. Skepticism. Doubt leads to fear. If you have no doubt, you'll never be afraid. Fear is coming from doubt. When you are uncertain, doubtful, skeptic, you are afraid. This may happen. I'm not sure. Lack of certainty comes. If you transcend your mind, uncertainty and doubt and fear disappear. Are there such human beings who have no fear, no doubt, and are living in a state of awareness where they can intuitively know everything. Have, can we have the power to project them? Yes, we do. How do they appear? If we can't, we can't know them because if they are human beings, they should be just like us. We call such human beings, and they exist, we call these human beings Perfect because imperfection is in the mind and they transcend the mind and live in that life. They have no uncertainties at all. If you come across such a person and you talk to them, they talk with certainty about whatever they know. Nothing is maybes in their language. No perhapses and maybes. Because they are not talking from surmises or from learnedness. They are talking from awareness, direct awareness. That is why we call such people perfect. They are alive. If they are dead, we can't talk to them. We can talk to a mind about dead people. We can imagine that we are talking to them. But you can't talk alive like we are talking to each other now. Therefore, they are living persons. 
Why do we call them masters? Because they come and respond to our seeking and are able to teach us how to be exactly like them. Where do they exist? Do they exist in the Himalayas? In the uh, higher mountains or something? I've been to those mountains. I got jobs there to do in the Himalayas for a long time. I, I saw many masters. None of them knew anybody in America or other places. They, we don't deal with any of them. Here our mind is making up. I have contact with ascended masters. I have contact with so many. You can make up any master you like in the mind. They're all mental game. The truth is different. When your seeking is strong, seeking what? Many people come to me and say, we know we are seeking something, we are not sure what it is. How can you be seeking if you don't know what you are seeking? No, we are seeking. Something is missing. But you don't know what it is. Why don't you know? Because you are trying to use the mind to find something. You are trying to search where seeking is taking place. You can't find that. Searching is a mental activity. Searching is on the data available to you. Seeking is something that is not available. That is why seeking is considered different. Seeking is from the soul. When seeking becomes strong, it's a very strong longing. You don't even discover what you're seeking till something happens in life and you say, that's what I was seeking. And one of those things that happens is when a response to your seeking comes from a human being whom we call a perfect living master. Just a human being. There is no difference between that human being and ourselves. Born like us, dies like us, falls sick like us, eats food like us. Everything, his life is like us, a destiny like us. He's not a superhuman guy. A perfect living master is a response to our seeking. What does he do? Loves us with pure love. That which strikes our soul. His connection with the seeker is at the level of the soul, not the mind. You can argue with him mentally as much as you like. You can discuss things. He'll discuss like any other man, any other human being with his mind. But what is affecting us is his pure love, not attachment. What is the difference between the love we experience with such a person and the love we experience normally with friends? We are so mixed up in our attachment and love and definition of these two words that our so-called love becomes conditional. I love you so much, what did you do for me? And that's not love, that's, that's an ego game. It's an ego game, I did this, what did you do? As if it's a business transaction. When love comes, you forget yourself. The lover, the beloved is there. The love of a perfect living master is absolutely unconditional, non-judgmental. It's not based on what you do, not based on your behavior, not based on your life, not based on anything. Such a person's awareness is already aware that you are in a trap of your mind and is trying to come to take you beyond the mind. You called for him by your seeking. Therefore, he has appeared. In India, they say, when a disciple is ready, a master appears. They never say when you're ready, you can find one. Because when you try to find, it's a mind. People try to find for their life. At the end, the master appears, which they were never finding. Pure coincidence, pure chance, pure circumstance. I'm glad there are coincidences. That's a good method to appear. By coincidence, such a human being appears when our seeking is set. That's strong. When we are ready, he appears. That's what they say. What does he do? He becomes a friend. So that we can experience love. And so many people, my friends and I, have experienced with our master. You see my master's picture here. We have experienced a love that's totally unconditional. No condition whatsoever. Such a person will love you 
if you love him. Such a person, if you are seeking, will love you if you don't love him. Such a person, if you are a seeker, will love you if you hate him. Such a person will love you if you kill him. That's the kind of love of a perfect living master. Very rare. I know they are very rare people that appear in this life. But they do appear with their seekers. It's a design we have made ourselves at a spiritual level. We don't know it because we don't know our spiritual level at all. We are living in a world of mind, three worlds, physical, sensory, causal, causal because everything is caused from there, all mental worlds we are living in. And here our seeking is beyond that. That's rare seeking by the way. We don't seek that normally. We seek some relief from our problems here. I am in pain, please help me. I am poor, please get me some more money. I am homeless, find me a home, find me some food, get me some more cash, get me some more of this, more of this. All here, that's what we seek. Very few seek to know who they are. Very few seek the ultimate truth of existence and of your own nature, who you are existing here. Why? Basic questions are not answered by the mind. Why did we come here in the first place? Somebody asked me once, if we were so happy in our true home, they call such current true home, what was the need to come here? And when I gave an answer, he was shocked. I said, we never left our true home. We are right there. If we leave it, everything will dissolve. Our true home is totality of consciousness, the creative power that it gives different names. You give name, God, Creator. If you personify, then we bring them at the lower level. We don't personify, we take it to the top level, totality of consciousness from where every level has been born, within us. Where is this totality of consciousness? Obviously, it can't be outside the created part. It's within the creative power. The self, the ultimate self is the creative power. When you discover that, that you are actually in the highest form, only one division was made with space and time. There's only one. Nothing else exists. All existence comes from there. And you are part of that existence at all times. Then how can you say that God is separate from you? There's no separation at all. But you can't say that today here. You can say it if you can cross the boundary of the mind and discover you are not the body. It's just a costume you are wearing for an experience. You are not the mind. It's a costume you are wearing to create space and time and experience a different way. Are you a soul, unit of consciousness? Yes. But is that also costume? That. Now that requires a still higher level, one more level. When you cross the mind, you discover that you are not body, you are not in time and space, it's all created. And you are a soul, life force that gives you life, that makes everything alive, that makes your mind alive, makes your senses alive, makes your body alive, makes the whole world alive. That's your soul. How many souls are there? Trillions of souls. I was told that there is a bacteria in everybody's belly here. Good bacteria and bad, bad bacteria. They send messages to us, to our brain. They are living beings. Each has a soul. About three trillion we all carry. And imagine how many souls there are existing. Infinite number. Then which soul is controlling all this? The truth is there is only one soul. All this division is within that one soul. It's experience. And for that discovery, one more step. And perfect living masters of that order, who are experiencing that oneness at all times, they appear in our life when we are seeking that kind of oneness. Saying we are one means nothing. Experiencing is very different. And you experience everybody is just part of the same game, big game going on.
all created from the same source. Those perfect memory masters that come from that state, there is no difference in, in their bodies and in their life. They live like us. Their awareness is that level. Their awareness is that level at all times. Not sometimes that they can raise their awareness. When we do experiments like I'm suggesting, when we do meditation like I'm suggesting, go within, we can only experience one reality at one time. Like I said, when you go to sleep, dream becomes a reality. Wake up, dream becomes unreal, and this becomes wakeful state becomes reality. When we go to the astral sensory plane and become unaware of this physical body, that becomes the only reality. And we know that the, the re only reality was what created the physical reality. We come to know that. It was like a dream. When we go to causal plane, we discover that's the only reality. The others were just created. At one time, we only have experience of one reality. When we discover the soul, we discover soul was the only real thing. Everything was created from the power of the soul. Only reality. But when we go to the top, we discover all realities were created and all realities are one. And that experience holds your experience of all realities at the same time, only at the top. That is why there are very few perfect living masters. My master used to say, even in the best of times, the number of perfect living masters can be counted on the fingers of the two hands. It does not mean there will be only one. There can be many because the masters appear where the seekers are. The seekers of that ultimate reality. The, wherever there are seekers who want to go to the ultimate reality in their life, by coincidence, master will appear. I've watched all my life this happening in every country of the world I've seen. It's not any particular area. Masters exist. And perfect living masters exist where there is that kind of seeking going on. They have come for the seekers. When you go there, you discover who is the master? Yourself your own self. There's only one. If there's only one, how can there be somebody else? It's the own self that has made arrangements to be a master in this physical world. That discovery is the best one. That the whole thing was only one consciousness that created the whole thing. And this is amazing that we talk about it. We discuss these things. And they're all lying within ourselves. But we don't go with it. We spend all our time even examining these things outside. We go to temples, churches, synagogues, mosques, religious places to find this truth. All built by us. What about this one? This church, this temple, this mosque, our head. Don't you think it's good enough? All oh, the truth is inside here. I tell you, God is inside. There's nothing outside. It's all being created from inside. Go within. Check it out. Some people might think I'm telling some fairy tales. Maybe I'm making up a good story. Hey, part of, part of it is a good story, I must tell you. Part of it is being described in physical terms. You can't really describe it. Can you imagine, for example, I'm giving you an example of how we cannot describe. Can you imagine there's a huge big mansion, beautiful place. It is located in zero time and zero space. Nobody can imagine it. It exists, but cannot be imagined. Imagination is limited to the, men to the mental space-time concept. Limited thinking. But life is not thinking. It's more than that. Go within and check it out for yourself. I am just suggesting from a small experience I have had with this gentleman whose picture you see here, that what he, I call him a perfect living master, because what he promised he delivered. I have had many masters, so many teachers in my life. They teach, they don't deliver. If your thinking is only 
how to expand your mind, how to think better, how to lead a better life. There are a lot of teachers who can do that. And they are doing it. It's a very useful thing. But if you want to know the ultimate truth, lies within yourself. What will pull you beyond the mind is the power of love. And that is what a perfectly master comes for. To draw you above the mind with the power of love. A love that you never experienced before. No judgment, no condition. That's the kind of love that pulls you beyond. And you can experience it right from here, from the physical body. It comes up like that. So that's the secret. If your seeking is less than that, many masters will come. It does not mean that a, a perfectly master comes into your life automatically when your seeking itself is not clear. You are searching for something, masters will come according to your search, according to your seeking. When the seeking goes beyond the mental thing, seeking, then of course perfectly the master appears automatically. I have spent enough time traveling around the world and watching this show going on, how perfect masters have appeared, the lives of those who sought the ultimate truth. I have a feeling that many of you here are searching that ultimate truth. That's why I'm sharing all these experiences with you. What I'm sharing, not from any books, but from experience with that man. Hazur Maharaj Baba Sarvan Singh, my master. Perfectly master, great master. We call him great master. Very happy to see all of you again. And you come from many places, far off places. I appreciate your coming. It makes me feel very good when I meet my friends, always. So much love and devotion, I notice. Amazing. It's wonderful. So thank you very much for coming. We'll have a break now. You can enjoy some lunch. There is something lying there I can notice. <laughs> so we have given you enough food for thought. <laughs>